The Shudda articles, and then Amy discovered that 11 isn't on the site yet. It was number 10. Did anybody have any, or does anybody have any comments on number 10? Did you do number 10 okay? You all got the message? Yes? Yes? Okay, good. So, any questions or comments on number, number 10? It's all pretty familiar, I think. Mostly familiar. It's stuff that I point out in class a lot. And number 11 for next time, I'll email it to you. It has not been edited yet, so the writing may not be as smooth. It should be pretty much okay, though, understandable. So 11 for next Monday. Um, I also asked you to email me your comments about passive learners in Taiwan. Do you remember? Yes. You remember Miranda because you mailed them to me. The rest of you, remember your comments on passive learners? <clears throat> Email them where? Put it in your notes. I only got one from Miranda. The rest of you, do it today, please. All right. We're mainly going to concentrate on chapter eight today, but second hour, we will have a little demonstration with a web page. So we're just going to plow ahead with chapter 8 and then we'll have something different at the beginning of second hour and then continue with chapter 8. So that's pretty much what's on the menu for today. So let's continue. Sylvie, page 206, second paragraph. That's what I have, right? Sure. I was reading, and about Nie Chi Up, the earth you wrote is the Chi Dai Ge. I wrote it very well. Do you want to put it on the board? Maybe, maybe black would be better. Yeah. Black or blue. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, and I, um, okay. I really in the, uh, I went to a hospital for a dentist a lot, and to a hospital. And they, 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 use they use this for palate. That's right. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm going to have to look into that. I'm not sure. But this is definitely the one I also see at the dentist for the palate. Ying e si yong zhe ge, mei you chuo. Let me look into this. I'm not sure. Anybody else know? You can look into it too, okay? Please write it down, look into it. I'm also curious. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, anything else? Go ahead. When given a problem like this, it is always best to find the obvious things first. The voice is fricatives. 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 Yeah, good. Remember that. Say it again just to practice. Don't make it all the syllables are pronounced. Good. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute, and we've already mentioned that. This first sentence is really important. So when you look at a spectrogram, you could easily panic. But what you do is you first find your friends. It's like going to a party and you don't know anybody. How does that feel? If you go to a party and you don't know anybody. Annie? You feel anxious because you're worried you're not going to have anybody to talk to and you're just going to sit in a corner and drink something. <laughs> okay, so suddenly you see Sylvie over there. So what are you going to do? Go over to Sylvie and chat, right? So look for your friends first. That's the way you start. In reading spectrograms, look for your friends. And we've got two good friends that we've had right from the beginning, which are S and Sh. Those are our good friends, our old friends. And this is true of many 
areas of science and other areas of life where you're trying to identify things. For example, if you're learning to identify plants, you just find very obvious things. For example, then you know that that's Yetong. Or So you look for very obvious identifying characteristics, and then you have already identified a few things. That means you have fewer things to deal with, right? All right. So let's continue. So the first things are si and shi. Always remember those. Just go after those first thing. Identify all the si and shis. And that's the start. Go. Cool. All right, so look at three and then look at nine and ten. And I'm going to need glasses for this. So you should have already done this. I assigned this last time that you were supposed to, supposed to do what? segment and transcribe, right? So you should have done that easily without the text helping you, but the text can confirm whatever it is that you did. So we have three, and then you can, you can see the, the fricative there, the si, and then sh, nine and ten, um, also pretty clear, okay? If you can now start at the point about I in the first word. All right, everybody look at that just so we try to imprint it more deeply in our minds about what these things look like. The s and sh or the sh and s we've already identified. And look at I. You can see, you can see the formants splitting, right? The formants are splitting. And that's one going down, two going up. Let's go on. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. Good. Be really careful about all the sounds. Spectrograms. Mm-hmm. So the vowel in fox must be at seven with the T after it at eight. All right. So the vowel in thought, because we already know the sentence, right? So if we've already identified the S in spectrograms, the word before it is thought. So we can identify the stop, and then before the stop, where we see more markings, that's going to be the vowel. So that's going to be the vowel in thought, and that's going to be right at seven. Okay? What happens before the vowel in thought and after the sh and sh? Is there any voicing in any of the... Voicing, not voicing. Voicing. Every, everybody voicing. voicing. That's mentioned in number 11 because we talk about aw in number 11. And aw is much longer than you learn in school because in school they teach you it's short and you say oh. But it should be long and it's also diphthongal, it's aw in American, at least those who, who distinguish between aw and aw. Uh, however, in the diphthong, oi, it's really short. So you need to practice, if it's a monothong, in theory it looks like a monothong, a single a symbol, aw, you make it very long, and it's diphthongal. But if it's the first part of oi, make it very short. Everybody, toy, toy. boy, toy. Poison. Poison. poison, voiced, voiced. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. Is there any voicing in any of the segments between its sounds? All right, what are we looking at now? Before the vowel in thought and after the sh in should. So bef uh, okay. before the vowel in thought. And the vowel in thought is where? It's at seven. So look at what's happening before then. And then what happens after shi? Go on. Is there any voicing? Do you see any voicing? I don't either. OK. It's not sims. How do we say it? Yeah, watch this one. This one is easy to fix if you're paying attention just to the spelling. If you're reading, you've got the spelling to help you. E E is almost always E. So, 自然发音法 will help you when you're reading, especially if you're not sure. If you say Sims, you're not using the spelling to help you, you're just using habit. Because a lot of teachers, a lot of people in Taiwan say, for example, dip, it's very dip when they mean. Deep, yeah. Deep often gets pronounced dip. 
Seems often gets pronounced sims. And really is really, okay? Really is not terrible, because some people may say it that way, but it's better to say it really, in my opinion. So really seems deep. Put that in your notes. Whenever you see EE, -E, and often EA. EA is trickier because there are a lot of exceptions like bread and spread. But EA is also often E. Use the spelling to help you. So when you're right before you read it, kind of think a minute. Uh, am I going to say this vowel right? Especially vowels. So seems. Go on. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is going to be, first of all, this is pretty important. And it's important in that when you're reading spectrograms, you're going to see visually what we actually say rather than what we think we say. So should have, uh is voiced, d should be voiced, and have, should have. Often the H will be omitted. If it is a shutsu, not stressed, and it starts with H, we often drop the H. For example, that's his book. That's his, that's his, not his. It's not that we can't say his. If we're being careful, we will say his. That's his book. That's his book. But in running speech, we'll usually or very often drop the H in shutsu. So function words that begin with H and that are not stressed, function words are usually not stressed, unless we're contrasting them, we often drop the H. So that's probably what happened here. Should have, should have, instead of should have. So should have, should have, should have. Probably not voiced at all. Let's go on. There must be a T, a four, and an F, and an F6. Take them one at a time, because our brains can only process one at a time. If we look at four, four should actually be what? Right. So T at four, and then a f and a th at six. So at six, should have thought. Well, we're putting the f and the th together, and the f got devoiced. Remember that of should be voiced normally. But when we're reading it quickly, and especially if the next sound starts with a voiceless, uh, the next word starts with a voiceless sound, then it will often be devoiced, the vowel as well. Should have, should have, OK? Okay, there's not even a vowel there. You, you read it really carefully and nicely, but it's not that tidy here. There's no vo Can you try it with no vowel at all? Pretend it's just one word. Forget about what it really is supposed to be. Just look at, for example, the word H, right? And we're going to have to switch the T and the SH around. It would be more like ASHT, ASHT, right? No vowel at all. So it's very easy for us to impose what we think it should be on what is actually there. What is actually there is often going to be a wake-up call. I mean, that's not really the way we talk. We don't, often don't talk the way we think. So that looks like right? the way he wrote it. Everybody try it? And then add the next word. Aisht thought. Aisht thought. Uh-huh. OK. So it looks like from what we have here, that the vowel was completely devoiced. We've just got a bunch of consonants left. OK? Uh, everybody OK so far? Let's continue. Yeah, I'll go outside and find the money first. All right. Even though it's right at the beginning of a sentence, we can still pause before jishitsu. Try it again. Now go on from. Hmm? Yeah. On from, you can't hear me. On is jishitsu. Is on a preposition here? No, it's not. It belongs to? Go on. It's part of a, what we call a phrasal verb. And what is the stress of phrasal verbs? They're both stressed, and the second one has a tonic. So that means if we've run into a tonic, if we ever run into a shell tonic, what does that mean? It's the end of a thought group. It's the end of a thought group, which means that we pause a bit. Okay, so there are two good reasons to pause. One is we've got 
a pianudonce. And because it's a tonic, we know that we really should pause after it. And it may not be very long, but we should pause. And next, we do have a real preposition. So now go on from the S in spectrograms. Even before in spectrograms, we're going to pause. So those rules are real. <laughs> it's not just something you copied out of an article for your notes. They really, really apply. They really are used. So now go on from the S in spectrograms. Do it again? From the what? Well, we won't say it S because it's put in brackets, so we should just say S. And even if we were going to pronounce it as the name of a letter, it wouldn't be S. It would be S. Why is this one especially important to watch out for? If, if a native speaker hears you say, now go on from the S in spectrograms, <laughs> you laugh too. It's not just us native speakers, right? For words that will turn into something that will make people laugh, usually because it's tzu hua. Okay? It's not horrible, but it's funny because we're not expecting people to turn into tzu hua lai and ladder focus. I mean, not that he couldn't curse, I'm sure he did, but um, watch out for the ones that turn into something else. We've given you other examples like beach and sheet. Be very careful with those, especially careful. Sit and seat, minami and zhong. Because sit and seat are both very neutral words. Please sit in your seat, no problem. But if it's sheet and you make it too short, suddenly people are going to be distracted. Same with beach. Okay, what a beach. Uh -huh. Living and leaving. Those can also be a big problem because they are both verbs and they occur in similar circumstances. We've talked about this before. I don't like your living or I don't like your leaving. One of them could be a pretty harsh statement. And you may not even be aware of it because living is a very, very common mistake for leaving in Taiwan. I have already picked this out in all of my classes and many students now. Even with reminders, they still forget. Living and leaving, put that on your priority list. Don't mix them up. But when you put it in a sentence, it could be something awful severe. Okay? I don't like your living. Pretty awful. So please, special attention to words that turn into something else that will either be funny or embarrassing or most of all distracting. The worst problem is it's distracting. They'll miss your message because they're trying to process that funny word they weren't expecting. Okay? Try again. Good. Good. Unreadable. Remembering that some of the sounds you might have expected to be voiced. Voiced, pause. Be voiced. Mm -hmm. Might be voiced. Good. Some of the sounds you might. Why do we pause after sounds? That's right. Yeah. The, we're done with the main part of the sentence, the main clause. Um, and we're going into a subordinate clause, and we've also omitted a word. Which word? Which. which. Yeah, we've omitted which. Whenever you omit something, you generally need a pause. OK? Continue? When you have done this, read your next paragraph. OK, that was fine, um, segment-wise. How about for rhythm and stress? When you have done this, read the next paragraph. Let that sink in for a minute. Kind of let it echo in your head and record it. When you have done this, when you have done this, read the next paragraph. When you have done this, read the next paragraph. This sounds like directions being given for a test, right? Okay. Please mark the box next to the correct answer. And when you are finished, stop. All right, something like that. When you have done this, read the next paragraph. Go. Everybody? All right, two things I heard to watch out for. What's wrong here? When you have done this, watch the end, right? When you have done this, and the second one, read the next paragraph. Yay, good, you're getting it. So try it again, watch those two points as well. Go. When you have done this, read the next paragraph. 
That was much better, except for when you have done, needs to go a little faster. When you have done this, when you have, when you have, you have are unstressed, so they're gonna go by pretty fast. So don't say, when you have done this, 听起来怪怪的, okay? When you have done this, da, 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 da. When you have done this, read the next paragraph. Go. Mm -mm. Try it again. Go. Okay. The have is still too slow. When you have, when you have, when you have, when you have done this, read the next paragraph. Go. Good. Next. next. Hand. Next. next. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's just make sure we understood it. From the S and spectrograms, where is the S and spectrograms? At what number? Nine and ten, right? And we wanted to transcribe uh, spectrograms were unreadable. Remembering that some of the sounds might be voiceless. We might expect them to be voiced. In theory, they are, but in practice, they're often devoiced. Uh, devoiced. Let's go on. All right, let's go to 10 and 11 and also watch spectrograms, not SPAC, spectrograms. You're getting pretty close. It's already quite good, much better than before, but you still need to close your mouth more. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. Almost grit your teeth. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. Now you're getting it. Just it yatsu ba yao ho. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. You're still opening your mouth. We don't we don't close our teeth together to make eh, but I'm just doing it so that you can hear the voice, hear the correct sound with your own voice. Listen. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. You know, you're opening your mouth. Yeah, huh? Don't, don't move. Just keep your teeth together. Spectrograms. Uh -huh. Spectrograms. You're opening your mouth. You're opening your mouth. Spectrograms. You can't. You can't. Spectrograms. Spectrograms. Uh, Spectrograms. 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 Not spoke. Spectrograms. Spec. You can still make the right position with your tongue. Spec. There we go. Spectrograms. Spec. Your k. Uh, you open your mouth. Spec. Uh, okay. That's the way it sounds. We don't put our teeth together to make it. I'm only doing that so you resist the urge to say spectrograms. Your brain says that's the right way. But now we have to tell your brain a different way, to get used to a different way. And these are just exercises to help you produce the right sound. You're doing much better. It's improved a lot, but you're still going to the A side. We go, need to move it up to the S side. Spec, spec. When do we do this in English? Spectrograms is not the way we really say it. That was just an exercise to get the S sound. When do we talk like this? There's a situation. Can you guess? We actually do talk like this sometimes. It's for a very special purpose. Sounds a lot better opening the mouth, doesn't it? Anybody know? All right, somebody keeps making the same mistake over and over and over again, and they're slowing down your work. But you've decided you're not going to get angry with them. You're going to be patient and just remind them one more time. Vivian, what are you thinking? Just Yes, you got it. You got it. So, oh, would you please do it one more time more carefully? <laughs> I'm being really nice. <laughs> We do that when we want people to know that our patience is gone, but we're forcing ourselves to be nice. Although you can see clearly that I don't really want to be nice, we're still keeping our, our temper inside. 
that's when we do something like this, but it shows anger. So you have to be careful with that. So don't do this in actual speech. It's only an exercise to get your tongue higher up so you say eh instead of eh. So I'm still trying to find the magic pill that will solve this, or they sometimes say the silver bullet. I will solve this in Taiwan English because somehow I believe it doesn't have to be so hard. You have it in Chinese, you have it in Mandarin, both in Minayu and in Mandarin. So, jie, jie, eh, eh, eh. we don't say jia. If you, that sounds like a child, right? Jia, 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 jia. Doesn't that sound very childish? You didn't urshin. What are you thinking, Tina? Okay, you had a reaction. I couldn't understand it. Um, weird. weird? Yeah, it sounds like a really humpy to get and then just a buzz in the girl. Tata Jiji doesn't sound dead. Yeah, get what time what sits later. Okay, dead. Yeah, realize that it does the same thing in English. When you say dead, yeah, it's dead. Yeah, it's your den, right? Is that right? Am I, am I characterizing it correctly? It does something similar in English as well. That's why you should avoid it. That's why I react immediately. You can see my reaction is visceral. Because people react emotionally to certain mistakes more than others, so watch this one. You can fix it, but you have to be aware of it and you have to be motivated to fix it. If you're not motivated, then we'll say it a hundred times and I'll say, just one more time. Right? Okay? So, eh, 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 eh. What was our word? Expect. Everyone, expect. Expect. Please put this in your notes. If you can think of a better way to help Taiwanese fix this, please tell me. Think about it. A way that would work for you. I'm only work, uh, using what I, think, what I think would work. What I've observed seems to work a little bit anyway. It's not necessarily the best. But think about how we can teach eh and how we can get people to establish the new habit. Teaching the sound is one thing. That's usually not so hard. But putting it in where it belongs is harder to change because that's habit. So one more time, expect. Ek, watch the k. Expect. 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 There we go. That sounds very good. Go ahead. And also spectrograms. 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 Right. Good. Okay. Good. That was good. That's a good F. Okay, let's look at 11. 11, we can see a very clear vowel there, can't we? The vowel is not devoiced, it's very clear. Uh, we can see the form and structure very clearly. Okay? Uh, you can see the coming together, together of the second and third form for the F. Okay, so again, together. together. That's good. Everyone, together. together. T, not two, t. t. Together. together. Good, together. together. Good, can you see F2 and F3 coming together around 11 going into 12? Yes or no? Yes. Good, okay. Miranda can. I don't know about the rest of you. Let's go in. Yes. It's also F12. F12? F12. Mm-hmm. Okay, highly, not highly, highly. Good. Uh -huh. R, or er, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good. All right, so um, after the spec, they come together for the k at 12, and then er, uh, t is also at 12. Highly aspirated, it's going to be voiceless. So when we get to the R, the er sound, it's also pretty much voiceless because of spectra. The k and tr are both voiceless. So they're going to spread out into the er assimilation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have a narrow transcription of upside down R with a circle. It's devoiced. Go on. 
voicing. No voicing. Mm -hmm. Good. Can we see the can we see the um, formant structure clearly at thirteen? Can anybody answer? <laughs> We're at number thirteen, right? We have a very short. Uh, it's short. Now we don't have much voicing, but but we it seems that we can still see this the formant structure there. Okay. Let's go on. All right, can you see three and four going down steeply around 14 to going into 15? Yeah, so three and four. In this case, F4 helps you a bit. There's, they're going down very steeply. Um, okay, it's released into er. All right, go on. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's at 11. Spec. Ah, okay. Hang on. The velar stop at 14, 2 and 3. We can't really see very much of it. It's not really clear. Hang on. Yeah, it's not very clear here. The velar stop at 14 is released into er. I think it's, it's voiceless enough. Spectrograms. It's not terribly voiced, so we just can't see it very clearly. I don't see it very clearly either. Okay, thank you. Let's go on. Okay, let's make sure we're following. So A is at 15 and 16. Is that one clear? 15 and 16 is very clear, right? Okay. And we can see a pretty even distribution after the R, right? We can see the R pinch with between 3 and 4, but after that, 1, 2, uh, one, two and 3 are pretty evenly distributed, right? And that's pretty typical of A. And let's go on. Um, followed by a long M, and we notice that as a typical nasal, a lot of the vowel formants are missing, and we've got fewer nasal formants instead, and they are much lighter, right? Okay. It's faint formants. Did you read that already? Okay. Occupying 17 and 18. So through 17 and 18, you can see basically two fairly clear but faint formants plus a third one, another one in the middle, not a third one. It's one in the middle, a little bit, the beginnings of one. Okay. Let's go on. End of this word. At the end of the word. Can you link? End of. End of. Right. The point is, you're saying end of this word. It's not. It's not wrong. That's fine. But usually we link it. End of. Make the d the beginning sound of of. End of. Okay. Everybody note that. It's something to forget. There's so many things to remember. So. That's why we have a weekly pronunciation improvement plan. Concentrate out on one at once. But linking is pretty important. It's not wrong if you don't link, but it just sounds very choppy in English. It's one thing very typical of both British and American English, we link. Whenever we can link, we usually link. Unless there's a pause, then we don't. But if we don't pause and the next word starts with a vowel, Remind yourself to link, because it will make it smoother and also easier to understand. And less, you're less likely to make a pronunciation mistake that way in some cases. For example, when you say anga, anga, but it should be a n. If you say n, you put the n over in the n, you're not going to make it velar. So instead of anga, you say a n, and then it'll be correct. So linking will often help you get the right, the right sound as well. Okay. Eighteen, watch that, everyone, the N. Eighteen and nineteen. And nineteen. Nineteen. Three N's. Let's try it. Eighteen. Nineteen. Three N's. Nineteen. 
Good. Nineteen. 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 I bet. Okay. It sounds really good, and it sounds different from what I usually expect from students. They say nineteen. 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 Okay. Does the sound in 19, the I, the answer, sounds so nasal? It's very nasal, usually, because anything that comes before a nasal is usually nasalized, and it comes after a nasal as well. So there's probably going to be no let up in the nasalization. The whole word from start to finish, including all the vowels, both vowels, are probably going to be heavily nasalized. Um, to say it without nasalization would take quite an effort. Nine, nine. Nineteen. <laughs> Nineteen. That's not so nasal? Not the way I speak. I speak more nasal than a Brit. Okay. From where I come from, I speak more nasal than some Americans, but it's pretty typical of American. I actually hear it a lot on the radio. There's just, there's just a lot of nasalization in American English. So, nineteen. Nasalized all the way through. Everyone? Nineteen. Nineteen. Good. Okay. All right, 18 to 19, we've already talked about. Let's go on. It might be best, though. When you see a though there in the middle, make us a charu yu. We haven't talked that much about them, but they are called charu yu. In English, they are called, anybody know? It was in the Shida articles, one of them. Charu yu in English. Apenthesis, 那个是, uh, 那个是加音, 就是一个音加, actually, apenthesis, they usually call it 音加. That's a single sound, usually, or just a couple, at most, a couple segments. But 查如语, that's on the phrase and sentence level. It's in 是的. Didn't memorize them, word for word, from start to finish? <laughs> All ten of them? Okay, it's called a parenthetical. Parenthetical. What's a parenthesis? Or what are parentheses? Right, Sylvie? In Chinese? Right, gua hao. So the things that you put in gua hao is something 额外加的,跟前面后面没有直接的连贯,对不对? So something that you stick in the sentence, 你突然间,你有个东西想起来,你觉得要交代, it's like a little interruption because I want to tell you something that I think is important. For example, he said, put that down, he said, it's hot. Put that down. He said, it's hot. Put that down, it's hot. He said, it's that's called a parenthetical. In Chinese, called cha ru yu. Whenever we have a cha ru yu, watch the continuation rise. That's its most Okay? So in this case, it might be best, though. It might be best, though. Once more, watch your final stops. It might be best, though. Good. The first time was right, lack. lack. How do we write lake? L A K E. Lake is who? Lack. Who did A? Lack. Good, you read beautifully. I'm being really, really picky with you because the more you improve, the more I want you to be perfect. So, <laughs> but you've really improved. It was very nice. To transcribe it as a devoiced z, as a devoiced or voiceless z. And which sound is it that we're talking about? Grams, day. And grams, the S, is mostly just Z. It's at numbers uh, 18 to 19. Come without some voicing. Spectrograms, spectrograms. Okay, let's go on. That is not an excuse to forget to pronounce your Z's as Z's when you're supposed to. Okay, let's go on. Mm -hmm. 
On this occasion, there was an R in this word. There was an R in this word. Or, yeah, he writes an, W A an, so that means he's probably pronouncing it as R, because we just can't say there was a R in this word. That's how we would say it, actually, but typographically, when we see an R, we're going to read the name of the letter, and the name of the letter starts with a vowel, so we're just naturally going to say an. So you can say there was a R in this word, there was an R in this word. That's what we're thinking, one way or the other. And this one, I believe, is read in British English, it says. So normally we don't expect an R after a vowel, right? For example, he's here. He's here. No vowel. They were. They were. Which is in American, they were. They were. But here we have the R because... Keep reading. Mm -hmm. Two words. Next. Next. Good. Begins. Begins. Not begins, but I, uh, uh. Begins. begins. There we go. That's good. So, this is called a linking R. This is a linking R. We call it a linking R when there really is an R that we talked about this last semester. For example, they were in the closet. They were in, were in. The next word starts with a vowel. <clears throat> And there's an R at the end of the preceding word, we have linking. So <clears throat> instead of making the R disappear, well, Brits don't think it disappears. They just don't have it. They were. But if there's a vowel in the next word, they were in. They were in the closet. Um, in American, we'll have it anyway. Um, in some cases, we have a final schwa and then a word that begins with a vowel. As we've mentioned before, there's no R there at all, as in China or in Japan. China or in Japan, there's no R in China. But we still hear it in the speech of many British English speakers because they're in the habit. So China and Japan is the same to many Brits as they were in, uh, were in the closet. Do you see what I'm saying? So we got the habit from a real R, but it was carried over. Mm, they overgeneralized. And then we call it an intrusive R, just a R. R. That's a linking R. That's called an intrusive, intrusive R. They come out the same in speech. We give them different names, though, because one originally was there and the other was added out of nowhere, basically. So one is a linking R. Oh, we don't want to use that for xian. One is a linking R, one is an intrusive R. Okay. And which one do we have here in the spectrogram? A linking R, that's right, because there is really an R there. At least in the spelling, we know that historically there should be an R there. Historically there was, later it was dropped in British English. We still have it in American and various other dialects like Irish. Okay, go on. Say at the again. At the uh -huh. beginning okay. of this word, at 20. All right, everybody look at 20 now. We've got a W, and what do we see there that's typical of W? Uh, keep reading, and that will give us a clue. It's distinguishable by the low second unit. All right. So look at 20, and look at how low F2 starts. F2 starts very low, rises very steeply. Okay. Let's, com let's compare the W and the R again, just to remind ourselves. And they're on page 203. Just to remind ourselves of the difference between R and W, which have things in common. Two and three come together almost for R, but three has the steeper rise, right? San But for W, three is also rising, but two starts very low. 
So that's a way to distinguish between r and w. They're quite similar. But if 2 goes down especially low, it's a w. And if you can see that 3 has the steeper rise, it's probably r. All right, so that's useful. Let's go on. Let's go to 22 and 23. And here we have un, un. And? Go ahead. The lower limit of the third syllable, that's 24. Third, the D. Uh, of the third? Of the third uh -huh. limit at 24 uh -huh. marks the beginning of the syllable re. The high vowel e at 25 having a low first and a high okay, so let's look at that. We have the un below 22 and 23, and we have a pretty clear formant structure there going into the nasal. You can see the faint um, formants of a typical uh, formants that are typical of a nasal. And then we're going into the ur of readable, and that is at 24. And you can see that F3 does start pretty low. Right, F3 starts pretty low there. Uh, let's keep going. The very short st and uh at 25 to 26 are followed, followed by a comparatively long th at 26 to 27. And the final syl syllabic uh, 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 Very good, okay. So, we've got up to er, the lowering of the third formant at 24 is the beginning of the syllable of re, that's at 24. We're going into the vowel. What kind of a vowel do we see here? A high what? At 25, we see a, a high what? E, right, and what is high? What is notably high? F2, right, and that's typical. Everybody can remember that. It's one of the first vowels we've learned. That very high F2, F1 is low, typical E, readable. And the lowering of the third formant uh, at uh, having a low first formant and a high second formant, the very short D and U uh, at 25 to 26. So we're in 25 to 26. We have a very short D. Is it voiced? Between, from 25, just going into 26, we've got a D there. Does it look like it's voiced? It is, yeah. A readable, it's got a vowel on both sides, so it is voiced. That, that readable is definitely voiced. Mm. Then we've got the U uh after it. It's short, but it's got a very clear form and structure. It starts out fairly evenly distributed, but then we see something going down. It's going down for the b, right? It's going down because b is going to lower the formants. And do we have some voicing in bull? A little bit, yeah, we have a little bit in bull. And finally, we end with ul, but does it look like a consonant? Or does it even look like a, an approximant? No, because approximants usually Especially sounds like l and m and n, they tend to be what? Darker or lighter? Pretty light, right? Just like nasals. But is this one really light? No, which means, do you think that there is alveolar contact? No. Probably not. So unreadable. There's probably no alveolar contact. So it's as loud as a vowel. That's why it looks like a back vowel, in addition to its form and structure. All right, so we got through that whole, that whole spectrogram. That's how spectrogram reading works. At first, it's kind of scary because you think, I never would have gotten that myself. But after you've gone through it a few times, you start recognizing more and more old friends. You get to know more and more of the gang. And the things you don't know are reduced to a smaller number, and then it's not so scary anymore. But it will never be easy, I have to tell you. It will never be easy, and you're never 100% certain. It's an art, it's not a science. So if you just look at a spectrogram, you can't just read it off. As far as I know anyway, so far. Machines will be able to, if you feed it into a machine, 
it will produce something, you go, yeah, that's right. But just in reading it visually, I don't know if people can do that yet. Okay, and that means we're up to here. Whose turn next hour? Okay, so Miranda, you start next hour. We're going to take a break. Let's continue. First of all, book sharing. Here's another book that I got with this same order. And this one is about hearing. And you'd think that by now we would understand exactly how hearing works. Do you un are you under the impression that people who study this stuff, they pretty much understand how hearing works? Do you have that impression? Well, we don't. There are a lot of things we do know, but there are a lot of things we don't know. And when you really get into this stuff, you will sometimes be very surprised because we often assume that there are experts out there who have taken care of everything. We often assume that, right? We don't know that much, but we're specializing in something else, but those experts seem to have figured it out. Often they are wrong. Often they will freely admit that there are a lot of things they don't know. The thing is that we often have this idea that the experts know about this stuff. Often their information is wrong. Sometimes correct information is being suppressed. Sometimes they say they know and they don't. Often they admit that they don't know. In this case, anybody who studies hearing will admit there are a lot of things we don't know about hearing. There are a lot of things we do know that are very interested, uh, interesting to learn about, but we don't have the whole picture yet. This is a relatively new book. It's called The Universal Sense, How Hearing Shapes the Mind. How Hearing Shapes the Mind. That's an interesting idea by Seth Horowitz. It's quite new. He's a rather unconventional person who is passionate for what he studies. His, a lot of his life has been spent doing crazy experiments, but he has a very tolerant wife. He's very lucky. Uh, so this is, I haven't read it. I've only read a bit of it, but this is a new book definitely worth looking out for. That's book sharing. We're going to do a web page first before we go to Klott for the background. And this is one I think I mentioned in class before. It's called The Case of the Missing Fundamental. I'm just going to read it to you, follow along, and we'll have a little demonstration when we get to the end. We have learned that when we hear a periodic sound, the pitch we perceive is based on the fundamental frequency of the sound rather than on any of the harmonics, also called overtones or partials which may also be present in the signal. This is a pretty dense opening sentence. Let's just make sure we've understood everything. When we hear a sound, remember we learned that in addition to the fundamental frequency, we've got all these overtones above it that make it sound much richer. That's what we get with a human voice. We also get that with various instruments. Some instruments, on the other hand, don't really have much in the way of overtones, like a flute doesn't have much, whistling doesn't have much, right? Remember we saw the demonstration? We didn't see overtones with whistling. With the voice, we have lots of overtones. But the pitch that we hear, if we had to identify the pitch, like find the pitch on a piano, is which of those frequencies? It's the fundamental frequency. Right. Now, I want you to do a thought exercise. What do you think would happen if we erased the fundamental frequency? We took that frequency out. We can do that with a computer, not too hard. If we took out, say, for example, if it were 100 hertz, we've got overtones of 200, 300, 400, 500, etc. And not etc., by the way. More and more native speakers say etc. It should be etc. Et means and in Latin. Etc. I think it's the rest of the things, other things. So etc. Um, so we have. 200, 300, 400, 500, but if we took that 100 out, what do you think would happen? We'd probably think it was a 200 hertz signal, right? Does everybody agree? That's what intuitively think we think. If we took out both 100 and 200, we'd probably hear it as a what kind of pitch? 300 hertz. That's what we intuitively think. When I say intuitively, when I start a story like that, what are you expecting to come? Wendy? That's right. Excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, actually the truth is different. So, let's go over it again. We have learned that when we hear a periodic sound, the pitch we perceive 
is based on the fundamental frequency of the sound rather than on any of the harmonics. Because we can take away all the harmonics, it's still the same sound. Although it sounds much thinner, it doesn't sound so rich. Okay? And these are also called overtones or partials. We didn't have that word before. Partials is another word for overtones, partials. Which may also be present in the signal. They may be present or they may not be present. If we've got the fundamental frequency, we can have overtones, but if we don't have overtones, we still hear that pitch, right? We also know that the fundamental frequency is the lowest in frequency of the harmonics. Remember when we say harmonics, we include the fundamental frequency. If we say overtones, we're not including it. That's the difference. There are exceptions to this, which we will disregard for now. We've talked about undertones before, and especially, first of all, in Tibetan chanting, we find undertones. With bells, bells have some of the most complex acoustics you can imagine from any one source. You might put that in your notes. That's useful to know. If you make a big bell sound, the acoustics are very, very, very complex. I don't think anybody's figured them all out. You can make a spectrogram and sit down and try to analyze them, but they're very complex. So you'll have undertones with a bell, you have undertones with Tibetan singing, for example, or chanting. But we're going to ignore those for now. Normally, the fundamental frequency is the lowest pitch that we're hearing. Is that right? And it also has the greatest amplitude of all the harmonics. Of all of the sounds we're hearing, all of those multiples, the loudest one is the fundamental frequency. But the reason we perceive only the pitch of the fundamental frequency is not due simply to its greater amplitude. We may have the idea that the reason we think it's a certain pitch is because it's the loudest. The F0, fundamental frequency, is the loudest. And up to now, we probably thought that that's the reason why we identify this sound as, for example, 100 hertz as the pitch when 100 hertz is the fundamental because it's the loudest. That's probably what we think so far, right? And it's very holy. It's not true, but it's very holy. Let's continue. We know that the harmonics of a sound occur at progressive multiples of the fundamental frequency, for example, 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on. But what would happen if we were to remove only the fundamental frequency from a sound and keep all of the other harmonics? What would you hear as the pitch of such a sound? If we took away, if we took away F0, we're already imagining we'll probably hear F, the, not F2, we'll probably hear the second harmonic as the pitch. That's what we're imagining. But you may find the actual answer a bit surprising. You can read about it and hear it demonstrated in the three slides that start on the page at the URL below. Let's open that one up. The recorded explanation is immediately followed by an audio demonstration in which first a tone with a regular pattern of nine harmonics is played. So you're going to hear a man explaining what's going on. He's going to tell you you're going to hear a pitch that includes the fundamental plus the next eight harmonics, nine harmonics altogether. We're going to hear that kind of a pitch. Then he's going to play another sound for you. He's going to play a tone which is the same as the first, except that it's F0. Its fundamental frequency has been removed. Now you can imagine what we will probably be hearing. Just imagine in your head right now. Nine overtones, nine, nine harmonics all together. That's the fundamental with eight overtones. First, then we take away F1. Just try to imagine in your brain what you might be hearing. Okay, thought experiments are important. Then the next harmonic up is removed. Then we remove the first overtone or the second harmonic. Then the next, and so on. The figure below the link is a spectrogram made with WASP of a similar audio file. So this, don't have to worry about copyright. So here is F0. Now it's gone. Here the fundamental frequency and the first overtone is gone. And then the first and the second overtone and so on. So that's the series of sounds you're going to hear. 
Okay, and let's, let's find out what it's like. Hypothesis one. We ascertain the pitch of complex tones by listening only to the fundamental component in the complex. That's what we thought. This means we're using the fundamental frequency to determine the pitch. But this is contradicted by, that means somebody else is just the opposite. The case of the missing fundamental. We can use the fundamental if it is there. So if zero, we can use it determine where the pitch is. But we don't need F1. If it's there, we use it. If it's not there, not F1, sorry, F0. But if it's not there, we don't need it. Let's find out what they're talking about. Here he has something similar to what I just showed you. This is a Taman Zoda. And you can listen to his explanation and demonstration. Um, do you think that the pitch changed? Bella says yes, the rest of you say no. Bella, did the pitch change? You change your mind. <laughs> Not sure. You didn't notice? You didn't think so the first time, but then you thought it changed? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. Misunderstood. Misunderstood. So you all agree that it sounds like the same pitch, right? Uh, it sounds higher, but are you going to change it to a different note? Uh, 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 is basically what we're hearing. But it sounds like it's getting filtered. It sounds like talking on the telephone or something, right? Which is exactly what's happening. They're filtering out the lower harmonics. Just listen again. It does sound like it's getting higher. Would you call that the same pitch or a different pitch? Confused. Wendy? Would you sing it differently if you were trying to imitate it? Uh, what's the next one going to be? And the next one will be what? Mm. You're all making the same pitch. We could go up an octave, but it's not quite the same. It's taking away the lower part of the structure, but we're still going to identify it as the same pitch. It definitely sounds higher because we're missing those parts at the bottom. The point is that what makes us identify pitch is not the F0, whether it's present or not. It is the jianggu between the harmonics. That's how we recognize a pitch. So this is basically what a telephone does. When you hear somebody talk on the telephone, does their voice sound different? Especially, let's use a guy with a lower voice as an example. Just the same, you talk to him on the phone, and then you talk to him in person. Does his voice sound different on the phone? It does. Does it, how does it sound different? Can you describe it? It sounds, it sounds more thinner. It sounds thinner. That's a good way to describe it. It sounds thinner. If you had to pick between higher and lower, does it sound higher or lower? Higher. It sounds higher, doesn't it? But this is a key question. Can you still tell that it's a male voice? Can you still tell that it's a male voice? Would you mistake it? Because a lot of these on the telephone are actually fil filtered out. So would you mistake a man for a woman on the phone? Does it happen often? Uh, happen once. OK. It's happened to me probably more than once, but not that often. 
But it happens in person too, not just over the phone. I told you that story about that one person. Their voice is very unisex, could be either male or female. I still am not sure. In person, or sometimes on TV, I'll see somebody talking and I'm thinking, is that supposed to be a guy or a woman? And then I hear, it really looks like a guy, but the voice really sounds like a woman. Usually it's a guy with a high voice. So it doesn't often happen that you mistake a man for a woman over the phone, right? It doesn't happen very often. The point is that the phone is removing all of these, all of these harmonics, a lot of them. It only starts at about 300 hertz. But men's voices are down below 200 usually, right? Men's voices are usually below 200. So their F0 is filtered out all the time when they're talking on the phone, unless they have a very high voice. But we can still tell that it's a male, right? So even with this filtering that makes it sound higher and thinner, we still identify the pitch as here. So we call that the case of the missing fundamental. What is giving us the sensation of what pitch it is, is not the F0 by itself, but it is the structure of the harmonics. The harmonic structure is what tells us what the pitch is. 它的间隔, 它的差别, 刚好是一百赫, for example, if it's 100 hertz. 所以只要是你剩下多少harmonics都无所谓,只要是它间隔是一百赫,我们会把它听成是一百赫的 signal. Even though it sounds thinner and higher, we will still identify it as 100 hertz. So it's harmonic structure that gives us the information about pitch, which is why we can reduce the bandwidth on phone conversations and still be able to tell whether it's a male or female and get most of the information we need over the phone. It also filters out a lot of the high harmonics uh, that we would like for, for things like fricatives. Everybody understand so far? OK. So that's what happens. Let's just keep going on this page. Um, the second demonstration lets you hear what happens if you mask the fundamental of a synthesized melody with a low-pass noise. You can finish this demonstration yourself. I'm not going to take the time, but put this down in your notes. Go over this page yourself. 我现在不放。它是如果把下面盖住，它用噪音盖住那个F0，是你还是听得到是什么调子？或者它把噪音盖住上面的harmonics，你还是可以听出是什么调子？That's the point. Okay, and then Wikipedia has an entry on the missing fundamental with a different sound file. Uh, question? Okay, we'll, we'll just look at it quickly, if it loads. And then we have this page with the sound samples. Seems to be um, loading very quickly, we'll just keep going. So in these files, the fundamental and first two overtones above it are missing. Okay, we're not going to wait for it. The pitch your ear and brain hear is in each case not based on the harmonic with the lowest frequency. 我们认定的那个音高并不是根据我们所听到的最低的一个背音不是这样子或者一个泛音 You hear rather the tone is having the pitch of the original fundamental frequency even when it is not physically present in the signal. Why does it happen? Well, very simply, it would seem that it is the harmonic structure that determines our perception of pitch rather than simply the frequency of the lowest harmonic that is physically present in the signal. We understand that all now, right? Okay? You will hear it as high and thin, but we still think it's that pitch. Mm, mm, mm. We still hear that pitch. It is, a, it is as though our brains calculate the difference in hertz from one harmonic to the next to decide what the real pitch of the tone is. 从这个背音到下个背音差几赫,我们就认定那个就是它的基频. OK? Yeah? This is called a difference tone. When you hear two pure tones, the ear and brain subtract one frequency from the other, and you hear a tone with the frequency of this difference. So, you如果听到两个不同音高的音,你的头脑会把它们相减, so if we have two pitches that are different that we play at the same time, we're going to hear a third pitch at the same time. Everyone's sitting still. 
You're not sure if you believe it or not? Okay. As a further example, if you've ever played with a two-tone whistle, you may remember that when blowing, you heard a third lower tone in addition to the whistle's two original tones. Now this is something. I tell you these stories about how I used to agonize whether the vowel in right was this writer was the same as the vowel in rider. Writer, writer. That's the kind of stuff I thought about when I was little. So when you read these biographies, like in, in Chinese works, they say, um, I used to play with a two-tone whistle. And I invented a language that was sort of a Morse code based on whistle pitches. So dun da means come here, and dun da means I'll go to you, for example. I played with that. I wrote out my own language. And then later on, my friend said, Karen, that's too complicated. <laughs> So we tried talking to each other with these whistles, and we didn't get very good at interpreting what they meant. My friend totally gave up. I was still interested. OK, my friend was not into that. She has not become a phonetician. <laughs> OK, mm. I noticed that if I played the two together, I heard a third pitch. I had only two pitches, but you hear a third pitch. Have you ever played with something like that? OK, well, I've brought one. <laughs> OK. This one has three pitches, but I'm going to stick my finger in one of these to block it, so you'll only hear one and two pitches at the same, at the same time. So I'm going to leave the middle one out. First of all, here's the first one. And here's the higher one. How many pitches do you hear each time? I only hear one pitch. All right, I'm going to play the two together. And you're going to hear a kind of discordant third pitch. You're going to hear a third pitch, but you may not believe your ears. So let's just try the two together now. You hear an ooh sort of sound in there? Amy, you hear it? Can the rest of you hear that other pitch? It's three sounds. It's not just two. Can you? Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it's hard to describe, but it sounds weird. It sounds weird. It's not just two pitches. If you don't believe me, let's use a spectrogram. Let's see if we can see it on a spectrogram. We're going to go to pot, and this is pot objects, and here's the recorder. We're going to record each pitch separately, and then we're going to put the two together, and then we'll see what turns up in the spectrogram. Um, I'm going to have to uh, fix something, though, first, because we need to make it narrow band. Um, we'll, wait till the, we'll wait till the picture comes and we'll adjust it. OK, we'll just record it. <clears throat> so record. Let's see what we get. Um, we're going to save to list. We're going to objects. We're going to view and edit. And we're going to change the settings. Instead of 5,000 hertz, I'm going to reduce it to 1,500 hertz. That will make it a narrow band spectrogram instead of a wide band, because the wide band is too blurry. So OK. What do you see? What do you see? You look like a kid on Christmas, Yumi. <laughs> what do you see? All right. Now, I said that it's called a difference fre frequency, a difference pitch, because if you subtract one from the other, that's how you get the result. Let's find out the frequencies that we have here. Um, they won't be extremely precise because um, it's a little fat here, so there may be some differences. But I brought a calculator just so we can make sure. Who wants to do the calculating? So I'd be say OK. OK, Annie? So let's just mark the frequencies. Let's just determine what the frequencies are. 
for each pitch and see if the third pitch is actually the difference of the first two. How many, let's put it like right in the middle. That's pretty good. How many hertz? Let's count it as 643. So Annie, 640, oh no, let's, that should be the second one. Let's take the first one because we have to subtract the second from the first. 934. Got it? 934 minus, it was 643 a minute ago, now it's 650, it's a little higher there. 635, subtract 635. 结果是什么? Two eighty nine. Okay, it's hard to get it right at the right point. But what do we get here? Three three fourteen. 3, 3, 14. 因为很粗, 所以不会那么准, but is it pretty close? It's pretty close. If we did it a little lower, we'd probably get it closer. center frequency we would get here we go. This is getting a little closer at the bottom of the frequency. So you can see that this third pitch is the difference of the first two, right? Now, you can do it with your voice, too, and then you'll see kind of funny things happening. Um, let's close this one. Let's try recording the voice, <clears throat> making other pitches. So I'll just use the low pitch and then do different things with my voice. But let's see what we get here. Let's view and edit. So here's our uh, on the light. Here's our original pitch, which is nice and even. Here's my but I'm on the same pitch more or less. And then I start going down. Now here, this and this It's still just one sound, right? So it's not like my voice put these things here by itself. If my voice is on the same pitch, more or less, as this, we still basically just get one line. Okay? But when I start going down, what's happening here? Those are the difference frequencies. Is that cool? Okay? So this tells you something about the case of the f missing fundamental. This is what our ears do. Not just our ears, that sound is out there. It was recorded, right, objectively. So that's a difference frequency. Now there's another interesting thing about this. Have you ever, okay, I grew up Lutheran, so I went to church every week, and I heard a lot of organ music. Now, if you go to the 国家音乐厅, the most noticeable thing, I think, when you walk in there and you're looking straight ahead is you see what? This huge organ, right? When it goes down really low, the pitch goes really low. First of all, how do we produce those sounds? We have to have pipes of different lengths. Now, whether if we put, uh, if, we, if we stop up the pipe at one end, if we close it up at one end, the pitch is going to go down an octave. So we can get some pitches, make some pitches go lower by closing one end. We can make them go higher by opening the end. We mentioned this when we were doing our other demonstration before, but just take my word for it for now. If you close up one end, you get a pitch that's one octave lower than if it's open. So you get end open, you get end closed. So we can use the same pipe to get two different octaves, right? But what about these really, really low sounds, really low, down to like 30 hertz? You need a very, very, very long pipe, even with the end closed. Do we have all that room to put, you know, we'd have to put the pipes probably through the ceiling, even a very, in a very big, big uh, hall like that. So how do we get those low pitches in organs? They actually sound two pipes at the same time. They use that to get the effect of low notes on an organ instead of making very, very, very long tubes to get the same pitch. So that's one practical application of the difference pitch in the, in the real world. Isn't that stuff cool? <laughs> okay. Um, 
All right. This phenomenon is exploited in designing telephone systems and small stereo speakers. How? Go on to the next page and find out. Now some of these links, the next page is okay. The page after that, a lot of the links need to be replaced because this site totally, totally revamped itself. But this is pretty amazing, isn't it? Because you may not have believed your ears. You just saw a rather dis or heard a rather discordant sound, right? You just heard a little bit of 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 a one sentence feedback. Um, I'm surprised very surprised. You can kind of doubt it at first when you're thinking, well, actually it does sound high or maybe it's a different pitch. But the second demonstration was kind of undeniable. Yeah. So anything else? Uh, I haven't played with that before. You never played with one. I think it's what happens to be available in the stores. And or is it, are they always the same? For example, <laughs> so that happened about when I was, I'm guessing, about eight years old. So everybody was playing with those whistles. And that's when I heard that third pitch, and I thought, is there something wrong? And I played it again and again, and I never knew the reason until I learned about this stuff. Okay. I first thought the uh, third uh, pitch is between so actually you thought it was an average instead of a difference. But now you know clearly it's the difference, not the average. Okay. I also thought it was like the average. That's all very logical. Many things are very logical, but often we find out they're not right. And then they're more interesting than we thought. Yeah. It's hard to imagine something like that. And it's hard to believe it. But now you believe it, don't you? I mean, when you see it with the spectrogram, then you believe it. Okay, our brains do a lot of good guessing, but not always, we're not always right. Uh, I, 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 I at first thought that it was just interpretation from our brains that we heard, uh, that we hear a third term. But, and I wonder why it really occurs physically. There's a kind of interference going on. So if you look into it more deeply, you can find out more about it. Just look it up. Just Google it. You'll find a lot of information. But if the, if the computer can hear it, then it's not just human ears, right? OK. I had a similar experience before. And I thought that it's only my hearing illusion. Uh -huh. And because uh, near my you know, music teacher will tell me what that really is because they don't think they think it's only two two pitches but I heard a lot of pitches and that time I think maybe it's some problem about my ears <laughs> how old were you how, uh, I, mean, I was in elementary school about how old okay there you go so you noticed it and then you wondered what the heck is that and your teacher said no it's not there that's what happens when we want to believe something. That's what happens when we want to believe something. And when our students ask, we just gai guo qi, right? We're going to have to go back on a lot of things. But it's not just teachers who do that. All of us do that. And a lot of things, like I said, about fat and salt not being the big problem. It's just everybody was made to believe this, most people. Okay, I honestly, I never believed it all along, just observing my own body's reaction to food. But if you hear something, look into it. That's what you learn from it. And sometimes you can go back to something that somebody convinced you didn't exist. 
And now, don't you feel better about yourself now? <laughs> and that you were clever for noticing it. Okay. Um, I didn't even notice there was a first tone. When I was playing? Yeah, because uh, I didn't thought about, I didn't think about it, and I didn't believe it. So yeah. I guess that's why I didn't hear it. Absolutely. When we don't believe it, or don't want to believe it, or don't think it makes any sense, our brains will reinterpret the data so that it fits into our understanding of the world. I'll just play it one more time, just see if you can hear it. You can hear that, ooh, that do do, the because it's discordant. Yeah. Okay. Tina? And um, when, when I first uh, heard the sound that I moved up on the frequency, and I was wondering. When we can say it does, it is because the filter is thinner, or when we can say it is, it has higher pitch. In this case, they have actually removed it, so it does actually have a higher pitch. It has higher partials. It has higher harmonics, but we still interpret it as. In this case, actually, there's a difference because with this one, you could actually see it there. With this one, we physically removed it. Okay, we will hear it in. We will, we will hear an F0, regardless of how much information we get. But we physically removed it in this case. It's gone. So they just used In this case, we got the difference pitch. It was there. We didn't remove anything. So in an actual situation, you're going to get that F0 somehow, because our brain will put it there. So it's going to be there. Yeah, in this case, we physically removed it. There is a bit of a difference. I don't know if that answered your question. So for the same thing, we could physically remove. We could give a, use a filter and take out that pitch. Yeah, but we would probably still hear it there, because our brains do that. Yeah. You need time to think about it. OK, good. All right, Wendy. My teacher was playing, and she put a uh, plucked, string plucked, mm -hmm. plucked two strings at the same time, mm -hmm. and I was outdoors, and I thought it's way. Mm -hmm. it's you heard a difference pitch. Yeah. Okay, it's real. <laughs> All right. Um, I will be mailing you. Uh, Another article, the article that I said I was going to give you last time, I'm going to mail you the one that's not the final edited version. But it's got, I think the information is still pretty clear. So please add that to your summary for Monday. It's getting close to the end of the semester. We need to finish stuff up. We have vowels and consonants, chapter what on Wednesday? Nine, all right. And any questions so far on nine? Or maybe some of you haven't started on it. Please go back to this page. Try the demonstrations yourself. Actually, I've been looking for a whistle or a horn like this for a long time. And sometimes I'll see something. This is the first time I've actually used it in class. I've been meaning to, and so finally used it. I couldn't find one of those two-tone whistles in Taiwan. I mean, no wonder you didn't play with them. I don't see them sold here. But they're very common in the US. So I finally found this, and then figured out we could control the, the pitches this way. So go back to the page and listen to the demonstrations yourself and go over the material because there's going to be another one that's kind of interesting as well that's related to it. Okay, any questions? All right, and who starts next time? Very good, Miranda. Good. All right, we're going to now go on to the next part. This is also homework for Wednesday because you need to be prepared, otherwise it's just going to be a bunch of very dry descriptions of this sound looks like this on the spectrogram. So please do the next spectrogram, figure 8.14. Have it ready by Wednesday. Study it carefully so you can relate what you see to the sound that it's supposed to represent, okay? So spend time on this. Do a good job on it. It'll make life easier for you because we're going to have um, harder assignments after this. This one is still not quite so bad. And they'll give you the answer at the end. Don't jump ahead. Try to, try to do it yourself before you get the answer. Okay, that's it. We'll see you on Wednesday.